Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Pathways to Excellence. Today we have a very special guest with us here, Mr. Nick Call, the head of Kazana Research. Uh, did I get it right? The research team in Kazana. The research team in Kazana. Amazing. Okay, great. So, Nick here is a tremendously distinguished individual and also a senior of mine from high school mm -hmm. from SMK Dhamma Star of Dhamma. I'm not sure if you actually remember those days at all. I do, I do. Do you remember those days? Yeah. Whoa! Okay, wow. You see me, Kami, Ditunju, Acha. That one I don't remember. That one I don't remember. Just like a, a part of the brain just conveniently uh, shut off right there. But anyway, Nick graduated from Harvard University many years ago. When was it exactly? Do you remember? Uh, so I was college class of 09 and mm -hmm. I did uh, Kennedy School class of 2015. Wow, okay, cool, cool, cool. So you went on after, well, completing your bachelor's towards studying like an MBA, was it? That's right, MBA ID, yeah. I see, cool, cool, cool. Pathways to Excellence is aimed essentially at showcasing very much examples of people who have managed to achieve excellence in education uh, throughout the course of their lives and also to hopefully inspire some of you out there to seek out this pathway as well. And Mr. Call here has... Nick. Perhaps, Nick. Mr. Oh, just not, Nick. Just not Nick. Mr. Call? Just Nick, yeah. Nick here, okay, yeah. will have some incredible insights yeah. to share with you guys about perhaps even what Kazana thinks of education and also perhaps how human capital can be developed or I guess a desirable pathway to which it can be developed in this country mm. right here. And before I go too much into the woods, so then perhaps I could begin asking you a couple of questions. Sure. Would you share a little bit about, I guess, your early educational background and maybe also what eventually led you to decide to study at Harvard? Sure. So first of all, thanks Victor for having me. I'm more than happy to make time for fellow mm -hmm. SMK DU and uh, so I was actually SK and SMK Damasaratama. Uh, so basically from standard one all the way to form five I was in the DU mm -hmm. primary and secondary school. And why I chose to go to Harvard, actually it's not very exciting. Uh, so unfortunately for your listeners, I don't really have a very interesting reason other than actually more so than wanting to go to Harvard, I wanted to go to the US. Uh -huh. And the reason I wanted to go to the US is for pop culture purposes and pop culture purposes <laughs> primarily, right? So I watch Friends, I read Archie Comics, I follow all the bands, I watch all the theme movies, watch Angel and Buffy, uh, all this, a lot of very American kind of pop culture stuff. And I thought, oh, cool, cool. La. Then I'll go there and then, you know, go on road trips and, and go to concerts and all that kind of stuff. So it really was nothing more sophisticated than just <laughs> this dude who just watches a lot of right. consumes a lot of American <laughs> yeah. culture and says, okay, I, I would like to go to the US. <laughs> and then the Harvard part actually came awesome. came later because so I got a JPA scholarship. Yeah. And at the JPA scholarship, uh, they made us take the SAT sort of a uh, practice exam every Friday afternoon. Okay. So after after prayers, then they make everybody sit down in the hall, they time you and everything. And depending on the scores you are getting on those results, then they'll decide what kind of schools to let you apply to. Mm -hmm. Because there's an application fee, they pay for it, they also want to make sure that mm -hmm. it's somewhere you could be competitive at. Mm -hmm. So that's only when I started to narrow down to Harvard. And, and so I applied for the, a lot of the standard IVs on the East Coast. That was the genesis of how Harvard came to be. But really the, the main thing before that is the pop culture and wanting to go to the US. <laughs> Wow, okay. It seems that we had a rather similar childhood in that respect right there. When you mention like Archie Comics, I immediately think of Betty and Veronica fighting over this orange-haired dude who basically mm. just kind of hangs out right there. Classic uh, American culture. <laughs> Alright, okay. So then, okay, maybe could you share a little bit about like what you remember like the U to be like? I mean, like, of course, everybody has a different kind of like experience of school, right? But I guess like what was that experience like for you? Well, I had a great time. Uh, I did a lot of different things. Okay, so it, it's a bit like this, right? Like, you, there's a journey through life, and maybe there's a path that you take, and somehow something you do, like, course corrects you to another path. Okay. I don't say course corrects, it just brings you to another path. Okay. Uh, and, and one of it was in DU because, uh, you know, in Form 3, a lot of friends of mine were joining the Interact Club because, because in Form 3, for some reason, only in Form 3, you could join Interact on Leo. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my friends were all joining Interact Club. But I joined Leo Club because the girl I like happened to go to Leo Club. <laughs> see, okay. see this, this is how I make decisions, right? I see. Uh, you know, it's not very sophisticated decision making, it's just... I see. Follow the girl, follow the pop culture, you know. I see. Kind of, I got to be president of the Leo Club, and I that's see. why I, I actually like 
first learned to really take responsibility for right. something. Yeah. I wasn't like, exactly the most uh, disciplined student. I mean, I, I did well in school, uh, but I wasn't the most disciplined. Like in Form 1 and Form 2, uh, I was actually sacked as assistant class monitor. Can you believe that? Who gets sacked as assistant class monitor? I mean, class monitor, fine. Lah. Who gets sacked as assistant? Because assistant, you don't even do anything. And then you get sacked. I think because of the little club, then I had to take accountability for what the club did. And so, so I learned a bit of mm. responsibility that way and stuff like that. But overall, I think uh, also the chance to just hang out with a bunch of different people because uh, so in school I played football, so you meet different people, I played basketball, you meet different people. And I think just that part is quite important. Mm, okay, cool, 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 cool. Great. Do you feel that some of your early educational experiences will eventually prepared you for your subsequent journey to Harvard? Because like, if you think about it, like, you know, a lot of people, they say that like the SAT is a test that is pretty difficult to prepare for. I mean, like it requires, of course, like very strong verbal fluency in the very first place. So I'm just wondering if like maybe, I guess like there were influences at home that led you to eventually have uh, so I saw this, that affinity. Yeah. So I saw this article of you, that you read hundreds of books in a year. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's, what's your count in a year? Uh, that particular year, it was like 400. Okay. okay. So you can read a book a day, essentially. It was a crazy year. I, I spent 15,000 ringgit on books that year. I literally took a book every single day. Every... It, it, it was like... Yeah. Okay, I'm not so prolific as you. So in a year, I try to read on average about 3 books a month. Mm -hmm. I try to get to 36. So I eventually get about the low 40s at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. Mid 40s, um, that kind of thing. But I think this reading thing from young, um, was always there. And that one is credit, of course, to my parents. Like, who, mm -hmm. You know, so one of my... Sort of one of my favorite books of all time, or favorite series of all time, is the Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle stuff. Ah, yeah. And I actually have a book; I still have it at home, which is the Adventures of uh, Sherlock Holmes. And I think it's Penguin, you know, Penguin Publisher type. And I actually wrote like this is the property of Nicholas Cole from Three Mushtari, which so that I was nine years old. Uh, and 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 I think that the reading I've always been, I've always enjoyed reading. Mm. I think that makes quite a bit of difference. Um, and in fact, if I think back to when I was preparing for the SAT, my friends in UITM, in that Shalam, the ones who were most comfortable from the start with the verbal part uh, were those who actually read a lot. Read a lot. Of course, there's some of it is privilege because, yeah, you, you buy the English books, and you, you, you know, you, you can afford books and that kind of thing, or, or, or you can have time to read or go to the library, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but I noticed that was a correlation that people who read more tended to mm. be way more comfortable or pick up the verbal stuff a lot easier. The math is easy. Mm. I think the SAT for the average, let's say, high-performing mm. uh, academic student in Malaysia, because the math is no more than from three. So mm. the, the, the way I would say this, that actually, if you're going to approach the SAT, like get 800 on the math, mm. because then you have a base already. Mm. And then after that, you work your way up the verbal stuff. <laughs> Would you share a little bit about, I guess, like what the environment was like for you at Harvard and like how you eventually adapted uh, to yeah. it over the course of time? So I thought myself as a really like hotshot writer when I was here, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, I didn't learn the fundamental, I just write. Then you go there, so my first writing class. So in, in Harvard, uh, every freshman, uh, first year student has to take something called expository, expository. writing, yeah, so expose. And then, you know, you can choose one topic, that might happen to be murder, so, the, so you write about murder. But my first essay that I had to write is something I got C plus. Oh, so I think okay. very fast, you know, very quickly in you know, this first semester, yeah, first paper. So this is like, you know, the semester started early September. This is maybe like mid mid October, right? Yeah. So very early on, I already got like, uh, oh crap, uh, uh -huh. you know, uh, you got humbled very quickly. And I think from there, then you realize that, okay lah, if you just accept that everybody else is smarter than you, a lot of things in your life in these kind of places will go much more smoothly. <laughs> uh, and I've always been very happy to accept that everybody else is smarter than I am. Uh, you know, the roommates I lived with were all... We all... Actually, none of my housemates who I ended up living with up until... Actually, even freshman year, up until senior year, none of them major economic. I was the only economic major. So I got to see like everybody doing different things. So probably my best friend from Harvard, he majored in chemistry, but he sold his soul and joined high banking in Hong Kong. But the thing is that like, you realize if you just learn to deal with the fact that everybody else is smarter than you or like, I think, and, and you sort of accept that, hey, okay, so they accepted you, maybe there's imposter syndrome, because I think there will always be imposter syndrome uh, for many people, uh, myself included, uh, as you go on, whether it's in university or work or whatever. But you try to at least tell yourself that you're here also for a reason and that 
maybe you were a mistake, but the probability of it being a mistake is probably not high. Mm. So you try your best from there. Like. And, and I think getting humbled very early on was actually very important for me. But the other thing also, Victor, you know, I mentioned I wanted to go for the pop culture. I wasn't going into Harvard trying to get a 4.0 CGPA. <laughs> I'm going to go there for like... Very different culture. Yeah, yeah, live the American. I mean, obviously get decent grades, right? Like, yeah, no, no, not to say I want to flunk out or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but at least enjoy the lifestyle of being there. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So did you get your wish to experience American pop culture? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, freshman year I went to my first mosh pit, uh, Taking Back Sunday, so that was nice. Uh, I went with somebody who, who went to Yale, Joyce Tagal. Uh, uh. We went together. Uh, and then, you know, I had a bunch of road trips, but I think at the same time, the, the part of school was also... Uh, I worked a lot of different jobs on campus mm. to try to... Because when you're undergrad, especially undergrad, right, uh, you don't have a lot of savings, so mm. you need to make some money. So I worked, my first job there was actually as a toilet cleaner. Mm. Uh, I paid $11 an hour, that's really good. Uh, mm. yeah. So I cleaned bathrooms, uh, I worked in the mail room, mm. uh, in, my, in my dorm, or my house. Uh, I was also a research assistant. Okay. Uh, that one pays just a bit better than the toilet cleaning, so maybe the toilet cleaning is actually <laughs> more value added. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, because at the end of the time cleaning, uh, I, I, I was earning about $12-$13 an hour, so that was pretty good. Uh, okay. Then if there's overtime, you get time and a half, which is really nice. So basically what I'm trying to say is like, yeah, yeah, I, I got to do all those things, but I think the other part of it, which is like, working the part-time jobs, which is what you see in Archie Comics, all that kind of thing, I also got to do. Like, okay. uh, and then you make some money at the side, which then you can do your spending money. I see, okay, interesting. Wow, that is um, a very interesting perspective on um, American culture. But, but it's true though, I mean like, basically the work that you do is essentially a big part of culture. So, I mean like, stuff like, I don't know, like selling DVDs or like you're a standard issue, like high school job, like, mm -hmm. like selling hot dogs and stuff. Uh, yeah, so my friends work in like yeah. Italianese or, or like one of the stalls in one tamar or that kind of thing. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> Alright then. Well, okay. So, I guess like, as time went by, so then, yes, you were kind of like in that environment, right? Um, where, as you mentioned, basically, you felt that you were humbled like very, very early on. And I agree, absolutely. Like, I can identify with that. Like, as time has gone by, right, I've gone very much away from like, the whole like, oh, oh my gosh, I need to be smart right here. Uh, or the smartest person in the room to realizing that there's an entire universe of people out there who are much smarter than me. Like, even in this country uh, alone, right? Like. I get to see like many of these people on a day-to-day -day basis. And that being said though, so like as you kind of confronted this for the first time, right? So then I guess like how did you feel your I guess intellectual experience being shaped along the way? Like through this whole, you know, like a tsunami of like different like job experiences and like also during classes and experiencing. Like I guess how did they eventually like shape the way that you were thinking along the way? It's a good question. Uh... I think to be honest, at the very start, I was unsure about intellectually where I stood on stuff or my opinions on things and that kind of thing because I found that like, hey, when you read this book or this person talks to you and you're like, hey, both sides are pretty persuasive. I mean, there are some things that I was probably more sure about, but there were a whole bunch of things which I was saying, hey, both also very persuasive. Am I just being a lalang here? Over time, the more you read, the more you talk to people, and then you hear these different perspectives. Actually, I just think that a lot of humility is required when you try to actually apply yourself intellectually, uh, in the sense that you have to realize like everything you read, even if somebody summarized the entire literature for you, yeah. is because you read a literature review, not everything yourself. And there's only so much that you know, and you have to be humble about what you know, and more important, what you don't know. So the only social media I have really is Twitter. Uh, I don't really tweet, I just retweet academic papers most of the time, but I realize I don't have a lot to say with certainty, but the amount of people commenting on stuff with such certainty on Twitter, unbelievable. <laughs> right? And I'm always like, really? I mean, how can you be so sure? And, and this is in part because I think the world is it's a bit philosophical, like, um, uh, I, think, I think the world is probabilistic. Um, but, uh, probabilistic. Yes, yeah, that kind of stuff. Uh, and sure, there's stuff which is high probability, you know, but you have to also, especially when it comes to things which aren't facts, right? So, okay, water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen, fact, yes. right? But if things that aren't facts, let's say, like, what is the right move for the government to do at this point? Not a fact. Not a fact. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think a lot more humility is required. Uh, and, and I see that sometimes the way people do it, they're very, very certain. And I think that 
any opinion that doesn't come with some degree of uncertainty should be discounted quite a bit less. Mm. Right? Uh, in the sense that like this person has a strong view, but isn't telling me what are the limits of his or her view and to what extent it can be used, that kind of thing. So I would say a lot of my thinking has moved, so the intellectual path for me has moved from actually being like an 18 year old who's like super opinionated, I was in the debate team, one kind of thing, yeah, yeah. to somebody now who's like, I don't know, man. It could be, but then, if this happens, perhaps... Yeah, something of that nature right there. Or, or just like, you know, uh, different tools for different situations. Yes, uh, yes. Don't be a hammer looking for a nail kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> a lot of things you have to understand within the context. Uh, don't be so quick to say this or say this. I think certainty is the silent killer of, of intellectual exploration. Ah, okay, okay. wonderful. As we now consider like your time now at Kazana, mm -hmm. would you maybe share, I guess, what led you towards that path out of the multiplicity of possible paths along which you yeah. could have gone? Sure. So I was a JP scholar. Mm -hmm. So after I finished college, I reported and they assigned me to the economic planning unit. Mm -hmm. So I was there for just under two years and then I got transferred to Kazana. Mm -hmm. And I got transferred to the research team in Kazana. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and I've really just been there since. So my JPA bond probably ended in like 2013 or something. So yeah, I've still been there since. And I think more than anything, the reason I'm still there is because I think the, the, the learning curve every year has still continued to grow. No day is ever really routine uh, and we get to just do a lot of different kinds of interesting projects. Uh, so for your listeners who are looking for internships, <laughs> uh, please feel free to give them my contact. As for the Research Institute, my role within Kazana has always included stuff in helping government. So whether it's MOF or usually the economic ministries like PU, MOF, MITI. The Research Institute was then carved out in 2013 to be so long to be that does policy research. So I'm the head of the research team in Kazana. We do investments research or rather research for Kazana. But I think when you're head of research, you are ex officio also trusted your KRI. Uh, in part because we also have a lot of policy touch points with government. So that, that's kind of the journey. It's not very uh, interesting other than like I was in JPA, I got signed, I got transferred. But along the way then the intellectual learning curve of being in Kazana has been really, really very good for me and I really appreciate actually the journey. Amazing! Wow, okay. So that should offer some uh, icons of hope out there for many Kazana scholars as well. Well, I guess, would you maybe share a little bit about, well, those challenges and why you feel that uh, those challenges have been, well, intellectually appealing to you, then yeah, that would be great. Huh. So maybe like, you could perhaps um, start by like give me an example of like what you might do in the course of the day and how that might perhaps fit into a grander picture of sure like, no, I'll give a fairly recent example from things we worked on right so in Kazana now we have the impact fund which I'm also heavily involved with and the impact fund is very mission driven so we're trying to solve issues that Malaysia faces so an example would be food security right. this example right so there's a lot that you know, I read about food security out there, and everybody's very focused on agri tech and, and all that kind of stuff. But really, if you think about it, a, a very complex problem. It is exceedingly unlikely that a single actor alone can find a magic bullet to solve a very complex problem. Like, food like how do you think about food security? And uh, and so then, part of the thing we try to do is think: okay, let's say we really try to solve this, and let's say it wasn't just Kazana if we could imagine a bunch of different folks working together to do this, how would we think about it? And so really we think of, or, or we came up with something where food security is like, for a given crop, let's say rice or whatever we want, you could actually think of three different ways where you could ensure that you have enough, especially during the crisis. Of course, you can produce more, so you can increase the productivity. agri tech, that all matters, it's true, land use, or true. But also, what about the government's role? Uh, especially the Ministry of International Trade, or they call it Investor Trade Industry now, in finding strategic free trade agreements to secure food. Trade is, is actually the most efficient way of getting stuff. Sure. So I'll give you an example. Um, Malaysia, we like to think we want to go towards 100% self-sufficiency in all the food we want. There's only one country in the world that has that now, and that's Thailand. But Thailand, even though it's 100% food self-sufficiency, it looks great, right? But you look at international rankings of food security, they're actually way below Malaysia. And that's because they have 30% of the workforce about there producing 10% of GDP, which is agriculture. It's very inefficient. 
to get the 100%, the last 1% of percentage point, you're putting so many more resources. This land is diminishing returns. So ultimately, I think we have to look for trade. And then the third one is a stockpile, where in times of crisis or whatever, just have something where for non for non perishables, just make sure you have a stock of it somewhere. Uh, a lot of countries have stockpiles. We should also think of it. So for a given crop, we can decide what is the right proportion to trade, which is a government thing to find oh, yeah. the FTAs to produce. Okay, that could be private sector and then stockpile with this government or maybe even some NGOs or whatever. So if you put things together, right, complex problems, different players trying to solve it, and then coming together to do that, I think that's the kind of stuff we try to work on. Because those are issues facing Malaysia, like, and that's the kind of stuff. I mean, of course, we also do the very standard macro research, uh, financial markets research, equity research, all that stuff, too. But the more interesting problems are these more complex ones. Yeah, and it's a very, very important problem to deal with. Like, if I can cite a historical example, so like, you recall the illusion of super abundance in the Great Famine of China? Sure. Yeah, basically, during the time of uh, Mao Zedong, essentially what happened was that, for various reasons, we don't exactly know at this point. Essentially what happened was that, well, China somehow thought that it had enough grains to essentially sustain the entire population of China. But then essentially what happened was that uh, the official had been apparently inflating the amount that was actually available in the coffers, selling those amounts off. The net result of which was how many millions of people died. They collectivized agriculture and then they realized, oh crap, we need to make sure we have enough grain. And then they realized they didn't, but they inflated the reports back to the central because they were just afraid that they would get sent to the labor camps or they would get executed. Yes. So. All of these different things right here, I mean, like they are related to the very important role that we're essentially undertaking, which is to essentially like you're having like food security and various other things of that nature right there. Okay. The train of my thought like immediately led me to the political, but I feel like you may not want to go, go for it. Sure? Yeah, just say that this is my own view, not as, you know, just, just have a disclaimer. When you edit the thing, maybe at the very start you could just say a point about how this is my own view and not not representative of Kazana. This is just my own view. Okay, fine. Yeah, no, All no right. problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Go okay. as controversial as you like. <laughs> Alright, okay. So then I guess like when you think about Things like, for example, policy research and various other things of that nature, right there. You know, it just makes me then wonder, right? Like, how do you view that, for example, something like policy research might actually influence political decisions out there, particularly in a situation where you have multiple actors and those multiple actors may be optimizing for different interests along the way, right? So then, like, even if you happen to produce, I guess. Like say reliable information, right? To what extent do you see it yeah. as being able to benefit the country? Yeah. I think first of all, for any policy that we hope to change, any change we hope to make, we at least try we at least should try to do it on the best decision we can make, which usually comes down to do we have the right information at which we can make a certain day you know, policy decision. Obviously there are some things where you still have to make a decision even if you don't have enough data, fine, but in general we should try as best we can. But the reality, uh, Victor, is that, and I think a lot of people typically don't appreciate this, um, is that for any policy to actually be implemented, or for any policy to actually jalan, you need four things. The first one is you need it to be technically correct, which is actually the part you're saying about the information we're gathering and so on. At the same time, you need it to be politically supportable. Because honestly, you can have the best textbook policy in the world, but if you can't get buy-in from it, from stakeholders, what's the point? You'll never get done. The third, it needs to be implementable. So that means whoever is implementing, whether bureaucracy or some private firm or whatever, they have to be able to execute it. Otherwise, no point. Cannot execute. Best plan, cannot execute. And the fourth one, it needs to be financially affordable. Right? There's no point giving the best thing and then suddenly, oh shit, this requires <laughs> way more than we, ex you know. So the same thing with budgets generally. So I think, I think we have to understand that policy is a political process and really I think there's been an over-focus on economics and textbook economics, for example, with, that doesn't really uh, jive with how things work uh, when you actually have to implement them. Which is why I actually prefer to think of economics in a more different way, uh, which is that we shouldn't really try to teach economics as economics, but as political economy, which is actually how the field started in the first place. And political economy, because political economy, then you understand actually, precisely what you said, right? You have these different actors, 
at whatever stage who have different motives, different objectives, who want different things, and then how do we understand the bargain that they have, that they all were like, okay, we'll do this after we negotiate or come to some, you know, whether, whether it's explicit or implicit negotiate, whatever, come to some understanding of like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And I, that's why I think political economy is actually a better way to think of the world than just economics. Okay. And I get to say this because I'm an economics major. <laughs> so I, th I, th I think the field could do with political economy, not economics. I see. I guess like, do you distinguish your understanding of like political economy from like economics? I mean like, okay, speaking as an econ major, so I did uh, economics at the uh, University of Chicago. Yeah. So like, essentially, well, when we think about economics, especially like the classes that I experienced, right, they were very mathematical. They were very much uh, you know, like based on certain assumptions, they try to optimize given like a bunch of constraint right here, and various other things of that nature. Lots of different like types of models right here. We did also, I guess, do quite a fair bit of reading uh, here and there of like different types of thinkers. Basically, like you have Adam Smith, then you have like Marx, you have like, a whole bunch of different things right there. They just imagine like the entire school just walking around like having read like all these like uh, thinkers at right front and center right here. But I guess like when you understand like political economy, so then like um, what is your I guess operational definition of uh, political economy? Yeah. So I think first of all, the economic models that we learn aren't useless. I just think that we cannot treat them ideologically. We have to figure out, you know, they, it's, it's as if you have a toolbox. Sometimes some things a hammer, some things a screwdriver, some things a spanner, some, whatever lah. And then try to figure out for the right situation what the appropriate method should be, uh, or what the appropriate model you should use uh, should be. But where I, I, I think uh, political economy is slightly different is that political economy takes into account, again, this structures, or uh, these institutional structures and, and political actors you have, let's call them the elites, for lack of a better term, uh, and what goes on in whatever sort of objective function they're trying to maximize, and then try to see that, okay, once you understand this, you can understand some of the structures of the economy or why the economy is a certain way, and, or, or vice versa. Uh, just to give an example, right, in 1688, the UK, or rather England, had the Glorious Revolution, uh, which was basically the removal of Charles II uh, and they brought in William the Orange and Mary uh, so fine, okay they did that but, but the real consequence of the Glorious Revolution is that Parliament became strong and Parliament became strong which meant that the people who were in Parliament suddenly their interests get maximised and these were a bunch of merchants and commerce people who were trying to make money and so property rights will come from, from this kind of folks because they want to protect what's there so they can always get rents from it or whatever. If you contrast that with, let's say, another place, the Middle East where, or the Ottoman Empire where, let's say, military conquest is very important or even, or even uh, uh, religion is very important. And if you get legitimacy from, military, uh, from the military might or from uh, religious orthodoxy, then you're going to have policies that support that. But if your legitimacy comes from like, a bunch of commercial people, then okay, like, you'll get commercial policies. So I think economics alone doesn't recognize that. I think political economy, then you say, okay, like, these guys have different things. And, and in part, this is an argument why there was a great divergence between the Middle East and Europe. And, the, and one of the arguments is actually these forces of legitimacy, which is a very political economy argument rather than strict economics. Well, as I guess like you move on, right? so towards leadership within Kazana, right? Like, how do you see, I guess, that like some of the things that you were, I guess, thinking about or learning about, right? Even as you uh, went to Harvard, right? Like, started to manifest also within your career. Well, to be honest, for leadership, I don't know if I necessarily would say that uh, Harvard really influenced me that way. I mean, yeah, I had some position of leadership even in Harvard itself, but I don't think those necessarily influence the way I thought about leadership as much. Of course, it gave me some experiences. Uh, I talked about the Leo Club earlier, so I was also like, for the cleaning toilet thing, I was also a captain. Uh, so you need crews to clean dorms and whatever. Uh, but I, I would actually say that my philosophy of leadership or the way or the examples of leadership I try to emulate, I learned more from actually sports more than anything. Wow. Um, from, from actually primarily basketball uh, and trying to understand that there are different styles of leadership. So, okay, you went to Chicago, so Michael Jordan has a certain style. Uh, and then you contrast that with, let's say, 
Magic Johnson, few of these people, and then you try to see like, actually you realize, okay, maybe you need to do different things at different points. Or there isn't just one single leadership style. If there's a crisis, yeah, you can't be like too sort of, hey, let's all huddle and come to some consensus. If there's a crisis, somebody needs to make a decision quickly. But if you're just brainstorming or you're trying to find good research ideas or like tackle a difficult problem, you can't be like, this is the way, that one has to be more process. So there are different ways to do it. Uh, and when it comes to people management, especially like different people respond to different things. And if you're a hammer, hitting everything as a nail, it long term won't work out for you. Actually, I really learned a lot of my leadership stuff actually from reading about actually the NBA and the teams there and that kind of thing. Amazing. Wow. Okay, cool. Like, I guess like uh, an intuitive thing that people would, um, I guess like think about when they try to connect academics and like leadership might be, they might think about like your NBA and like perhaps like the leaders who essentially had gone through, I guess like that whole experience. Because it's not just you, right? It's like, so like people like, if I'm not wrong, Taman Chandigaratnan, now the president of Singapore. Sure. DCN1, for example, so like uh, Cambridge uh, bachelors and eventually then MPA after becoming senior members for that matter. Would you share a little bit of your thinking also when you went into doing the MPA eventually? Yeah, no, I think to be honest, uh, after you graduate from undergrad, after a while, at least for me, um, and I think many people, I, I don't think this, I don't think I'm special or anything like that, many people get itchy and they want to go back to school again or at least try something different uh, you know you've been working so i've been working for four years at the point or three years a bit when i applied and i was like okay lah i want to go back to school do something different and then uh therefore what should the right program be and then from there it's more your interest what you want to dive into it was really a feeling of restlessness uh, which is why i wanted to go back to school more than anything it wasn't you know uh, a lot of people are very uh a, a lot more intentional about it than I am. They're like, and okay. it's justified the means. Or, or, or rather, they are they are more clear about why they went. They have better reasons than like, he likes the pop culture for going to study. You know, people like <laughs> they want to deliver art stay or whatever. The uh, result was the same. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm a bit more like, yeah. okay, like, I think this feels like the right time to go and do a program. Right. They, let's find the right one and then fix that. Not very uh, sophisticated kind of way of doing things. Oh, that's that's totally fine. All right, cool. Well, I guess like maybe like as we look um, again and zero in on I guess your current role as well. So then like would you share some uh, I guess insight into your current role and your responsibilities uh, at your role in Kazana? Yeah, sure. I'm the head of research, which is one of the divisions in Kazana. Uh, and as head of research, I'm essentially responsible for uh, whatever research the investment fund needs. Uh, the majority of course is investments, but also every now and then we have policy support that the government asks from us or uh, things like that, uh, which come out here and there. But for the most part, we do investors research. I, I break it down to four types of research within the investors research team. So one is macroeconomics, very standard, the kind of stuff that you will learn in school, uh, actually. Uh, this interest rate, exchange rates, all that kind of stuff. Second stuff is financial markets, especially public markets, where this is the markets itself. Like, Right, so a lot of understanding the equity markets and things like that. Uh, the third is sector research, sector-based research where you're looking at new themes. So let's say you might look at consumer or you'll look at um, semiconductors or you'll look at healthcare or, or AI or whatever, right? So that's sector-based. Uh, and the fourth one, I call it corporate research. And that one's a combination of two things. It's value creation, meaning like, okay, let's say because Kazana, we have uh, holding some large holding some Malaysian companies. How do we think about value creation for them, right? Uh, because we have bought seats. And then the second one is sustainability research. Now. So because uh, this is, not, it goes beyond just the ESG stuff, but also how do we think about the impact of climate uh, adaptation of these companies and things like that. So those are the four things we generally do with the public policy stuff. Okay, cool. And on top of that, we also, I charge of all the knowledge events. So Kazana, we have a, an old forum called the Kazana Mega Trans Forum. Um, so we, the research team is also responsible for that. I see. Okay, okay. Cool, cool, cool. So then, now, as we move forward, I guess maybe could you tell me a little bit about, well, you're thinking about human capital and its, I guess, importance for this country as well? Sure. So, I mean, now a very broad topic. Okay, maybe I'll start with the easier one, then 
well, which is on the scholarships part, how do you think about it? Because sometimes investments in human capital, actually there are two different ways. One is via the scholarships, which then you invest in directly people itself. Then there is something called Yayasan Ami, which also has done the Trust Me program. At the same time, of course, Kazana has also invested in things like um, recently 42 Global, which is a uh, computer science uh, training program for graduates mm. or people who, who aren't sure if they want to go to university, like those kind of folks, right? So there's the type where we invest in the companies that do the training. Um, then there is like starting a program to work with schools and then the scholarships. We also have something where we work with Malaysian graduates, local graduates, to try and get them placement in Kazana and then train them a little bit or, or in our companies and then after that hopefully they're able to find jobs elsewhere. So there's, there's a strand of stuff that we try to do. Um, and, and you know, ultimately I think uh, you know, for, for a given company, any corporate, the two most important things you have to do what you need to do your, your financial resources and then your human resources, right? Um, so I think if we look at it that way, uh, how you handle this part says a lot about a company. You know, a lot of people say, oh, our people are our greatest asset. Okay, really? Uh, and, and I think then it comes to the kind of training you want to give them, the kind of opportunities you allow them to do. Uh, and I think Kazana, to be fair, is quite open with that. So we second people. Uh, to other companies to let them try out different things uh, just to see and, and it helps them as well because it gives them a different skill set um, for their career uh, we also sponsor staff to further their studies and things like that so, okay. so that's the Kazana what we do stuff the scholarship stuff um, so Yesa Kazana has actually historically given scholarships to so many people and I know they get a knock that sometimes they also send rich people but to be honest when we check the numbers they're actually a very small percentage and I think, to be honest, that part of it, we could actually do a better job. And the way I would think of it is, mm -hmm. let's say we start at the secondary school level, mm -hmm. maybe you send to some boarding school or something like that, all the way up to PhD. So the way I would think about it is that the criteria for scholarships should be completely married at PhD, and then on a scaling down to opportunity-based, mm -hmm. meaning you could be the smartest student, but if you are some bangsa lawyers, kid, no need lah. But if you are the son of, or the daughter of Robert Kwok, or whatever it is, at the PhD level, and you can cure cancer, yeah. please, please, please go and cure. Go on, uh, we don't care lah, we fun lah. Yeah. Because then you care about the mission, rather than the person lah. As you go up, even at the undergraduate level, I think undergraduate scholarships should be about unlocking opportunities for people who might not have it. So I would really, lean much more heavily on opportunity rather than merit. Uh, I think the merit part is sort of just to make sure that when the student goes into university, they can cope with right? Like you want to make sure that they can actually cope, they can actually go graduate, they can actually have a chance to do well. Uh, because not everybody's career depends on going to so, so you have to kind of find the right fit. And I think that part of it is figure out whether people can cope as a minimum thing, but then you focus on actually what opportunity can you give. So if the thinking then is that like you should, I guess, focus more well opportunity as opposed to merit, for example, at the undergrad level, yeah. for example. So then, I guess like, well, okay. What do you think is the best case scenario essentially of uh, funding an undergrad scholarship? If you could maybe like think of that. So um... so most like you know a person can you know like do well a range of people may be able to essentially do well in uh, undergrad, so to speak. Like, they may be able to graduate, right? But then, of course, that, that would be, I guess, like a range of different people who might be able to essentially well, uh, yeah. do well in university. So then, somehow or another, then you have to make a choice, right? So then, within this range of possibilities, then, I guess, you know, like, would you try to perhaps distinguish, like, you know, amongst all these different people who could essentially uh, demonstrate the ability to graduate from university, right? Um, would you try to choose, I guess, like best case scenario from like, all these possible um, people that we might want? So, so I don't even know how we would think about best, like a best case scenario. Is the best case scenario somebody making a lot of money in the first job? Mm -hmm. Is the best case scenario somebody being like graduating with a CGPA or 4.0 or whatever? I, I don't know what that is. So I'm looking more at like, are we giving somebody an opportunity that they might not have had mm -hmm. if you didn't help them with this? 
So maybe they wouldn't have gone to university at all, or maybe you know their university options were more limited, uh, and that kind of thing lah. And I I would look more actually ex ante than ex post, right? Like can we help this person? Uh, uh, and, and that would be my area of focus rather than ex post because I think at the undergraduate level, to be very very honest, it's very rare that undergrad makes a groundbreaking discovery. Rare. Of course, happened but rare. So this is the PhD. I'm fine to fund whoever you go do. But at the undergrad, I focus. I would much rather focus on giving people opportunities, um, and because it comes with not just the education, but the network you might get, and maybe you're like, okay, this person I meet wants to start a business. Now I can start because because I I know this person, or that kind of thing, lah. Uh, and, and and so, who sort of opportunity set can we increase the most by giving them this scholarship? That's what I think. Cool, cool. Wow. Now, I guess maybe as we kind of like move forward here, luckily we can discuss what you're thinking about as you think about Kazana's strategic direction in a world that is naturally moving more and more into well, AI technologies and also, I guess, like a world where food security is paramount. I mean, I remember reading actually an article just the other day about how I'm not sure if like uh, if you saw this headline, but the price of rice uh, essentially increasing, but you here will be essentially Kazana's well or Kazana research uh, uh, strategic direction. In, uh, I guess like this world moving forward. Okay, so I think things like AI and food, they require different approaches. There's some sort of little linkages, especially on the planting side. Maybe you use AI to give you better sensors and whatever for the climate. Ah, all, all that's fine. Uh, but our view is actually more on the investment side first rather than the broader societal implications. So where should we look to invest and things like that. Right. Which I guess maybe not so interesting as a topic. But I think if you look at what we need to try and solve, I think the, the food one, the climate thing is something whose consequences we have yet to really understand. Really because we know for a fact that weather systems are chaotic, right? Like chaos theory chaotic. So small initial conditions can change a lot. And, and we are like, in quite unprecedented temperatures, if you check the summer, global boiling, yeah, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, so that one is one thing. The global boiling is a very direct effect, right? It's hot, but what is the impact on the climate thing? I think we don't know yet, right? And and if resources become more scarce, and this is true throughout history, little ice age lah, whatever. If resources become more scarce and more volatile, there will be more conflict. Like people will fight Actual because they want to be, yeah, yeah. And so if you do that, then of course food production and everything else just gets screwed up again. And uh, even AI is also a cause for some kind of tech war or a trade war between the US and China. I think a lot of them, what we have to do is see A for Kazana as a fund. How do we make money from it? Right. That, that, that's always a commercial thing we have to look at. But we're looking more from the impact fund once the impact on Malaysia. Then I think it's quite different. And I think we have to use really like the, earlier I mentioned, right, like government does something, philanthropists do something, powerful. I think we have to look at problems more that way and then see how we can develop talent to fit that way. I see. Okay. So definitely about um, talent development for sure. So I guess like in a world, right, that is fraught with all these challenges, how do you view, I guess, like talent development and like, you know, a good way to go about it? Because like, you know, some people, they say that, oh, you know, you should go ahead and learn coding, or you should go ahead and like study the sciences. But it probably isn't so simplistic as that, right? Yeah, it definitely isn't. Anybody who tells you there's a single way to do it is, again, you know, my problem with certainty. Although I'll say one thing with certainty, that if we actually implemented this, it would reform the education system in Malaysia with just a signature of a pen. Mm. So if I could do it, I would make it mandatory mm. for children, and the grandchildren of immediate family of all elected representatives, parliamentarians or the state representatives, the dooms, that their children or the grandchildren or whatever of the immediate families have to go to a public school, primary and secondary, in their constituency. Uh... So then you force some ownership. Like, instead, like you got some parliamentarian, mm. A, maybe you know they, they, they represent some constituency in in rural Pahang, but then they send their kids to school in KL or like public school in London or whatever. Cannot lah. Cannot lah. So I think you have to make them go to school in their constituency lah. And you see you want to run on. I think the second part of it is also then, um, 
you know, there are a lot of people who are thinking about private school, public school, that kind of thing. I, I would say that in my experience interviewing as a Harvard interviewer, if somebody is like exceptional, public school or private school doesn't matter. Mm. They will be exceptional anyway. Yes. I think where private school might make a difference is if the student is not going to be elite or excellent academically, then it increases the floor, but it doesn't increase the ceiling. Mm. Because I think public school, the ceiling is probably the ceiling floor is probably wider mm. in terms of the achievement. Mm. Public uh, private school raises the floor, but I don't think it changes the ceiling. Right. So I think like so. What you're saying essentially is that like when it comes to exceptionality yeah. or something yeah. that lies like excellent, you're, like, you're, you're, you're right? thinking is about excellence, right? Yeah. yeah. And then public school, private school doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because doesn't matter. you know like even in order to you know achieve excellence, you have to invest in yourself and to continually self-reflect and then refine like uh, uh, things. And the most sort of driven, ambitious students will do that anyway. They'll do that. Whether you send them to private school, public school. I mean like, I'm sure that a lot of your own education wasn't just from like, listening to teachers in school or that kind Definitely. of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and so I think the most driven students will find it anyway. So maybe for the parents or like, you know, who, are, who listen to this, like if you really believe your kid is exceptional, save the money. Then just go to, go, go to public school. <laughs> if you think that your kid is not and they need a higher floor, then maybe private school is for you. Okay. I think the most important thing is actually something Darwinian, which is like you just have to be adaptable at every stage of your life. If you're not adaptable, that's when you die. <laughs> um, and, and I really think that the single most important trait that anybody can have uh, to continuously be able to go on is to be adaptable. And when it comes to then talent development, it's like, okay, la, this thing comes up, can I learn it? Mm. Or can I learn it quickly or that kind of thing? And if your answer is you are willing to try, that's already a massive step over someone who's like, I still I still want to use the calculator rather than Excel. Mm. Like, uh, and, and so I think being adaptable is like the most important thing. How how do you teach that? I don't know. Uh, I'm not a parent, so I don't want to give parenting advice or that kind of thing. Mm. But I think anywhere where you can put a student and train them to be resourceful is really important because I think that is that is extremely important. Yeah, yeah. for the adaptability. Yeah, it's like, and how do you even do that across like an entire society? I mean, that is a broad question, as it were. Okay, well, I guess now kind of moving onwards then. So, would you share maybe how you feel that artificial intelligence, right? Especially at an age where people can just use ChatGPT mm -hmm. to just generate like different things yeah. here and there. Well, I guess like reshape education at large, like within this country and yeah. in other countries as well? So I, okay, so I think maybe we should distinguish between artificial intelligence, the, 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 the one that you, when we talk about chat GPT, That's generative, generative, AI. generative AI. Before this, the 2018 one was all the deep neural network stuff, uh, which is the deep learning stuff. Uh, and I think both types can really help education. Let's be honest, right? Like, I mean, for work now, we still use Barn and chat GPT. For sure, yeah. And all of that, like we would absolutely use it. It's a tool, why not use it? Sure. I think as we figure out ways to use it and improve our productivity, uh, I do think the education system or educators in general will do their best to keep up with them. Okay, so what can education provide them when you have this like immense wealth of uh, information that you can access so easily that can ostensibly reason and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and I think then education will focus to different things, right? So I think where AI can really help is for each student, maybe crafting an uh, individualized lesson plan based on the answers that they feed into ChatGPT and that kind of thing. At the same time, so each student can chat GPT yourself, but then when they come together, so then how do you do a group project when you 34 aspects of something, putting it together and then getting them to work together, that's another aspect of education, teaching people how to get along. Things like, I think the focus will shift and memorization, even in our time, wasn't mm. didn't really you work, no yeah. do and you don't have to do it anymore. Much, for sure. So can you understand concepts? I think all that is important, mm -hmm. and I think that part comes when you have to explain it to other people, or teach it to other people, that kind of thing. I see. I'd like to challenge you a little bit for sure. So then, you know, we are living in a world where essentially now everyone can get access to these technologies, right? And essentially. When we move forward in this world, right, we're in a capitalist economic system, so then there is an element of uh, competition that takes place, and people have to distinguish themselves in various ways, right here. So then, of course, there will be then open question of whether or not, like, you know, our system will form so that there will no longer be uh, essentially a necessary corollary of, uh, you know, like taking part in this economic system. 
BLE, for example, you know, like the question of how perhaps a person might distinguish themselves in this um, system whereby every single person is able to actually make use of artificial intelligence technologies. In light of the ensuing challenges that this world will bring, right, I guess, how do you see that people will have to like, distinguish themselves even further in this way? It's a good question. Um... I don't even, you know, maybe at some point before you can Google or things like that, uh, or, or maybe even before books are recorded, that kind of thing, yeah. then yeah, maybe information is how you distinguish yourself, and, you know, that kind of thing, how much you memorize. I think, as always, I come back to my answer earlier of adaptability. I think the best people are those who can just like solve problems. Mm. Like, uh, you know, as somebody who, who, who has managed teams and that kind of thing, I can tell you that like, uh, the most important trait I look for, or at least I think the, the best type of team members are those where I can see, be like, here is a relatively open-ended problem that I have to worry about. Why don't you think about it? And let me know what you think. And if the person can do it on their own without necessarily being guided and then come up with something that as, at least is the first building block and kind of thing. Like, basically, adaptable problem solvers will always be fine. So like, um, do you feel that maybe there's a chance that uh, even even those adaptable problem solvers will be automated by AI one day? Or no, but they're, they're adaptable, they figure it out. They figure something out. <laughs> do something else. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Alright then. Well, I guess then. So I was going to ask how you would define the robust education uh, of a never world, well, but then I do see that we have, um, that we have like, some inkling of that all the way. But I guess now, when we think of that about the education system, right? I guess, do you have any thoughts on how it might, I guess, face challenges in adapting like this? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, technology will always move further than policymakers and sure, yes. regulators. And, you know, schools are still worried about how they're going to get kids to stop bringing phones into, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yes. But I think the very best educators will try to incorporate new technology as much as they can. Um, but it will always lag and students will always be faster. Uh, whether or not we are willing to revolutionize the education system, I think it's not really that important a question, in part because I think that a system will always move slower. So by the time you like, go through all the bureaucratic process to do it, some other technology is already here. The most important thing ultimately is for teachers to try to adapt. I mean, ultimately, like, the education of a child Yes. The parent is the accountable one. It's not the teacher, right? I mean, yes. in the end, it's the parent, the individual child. Yes. Uh, so the parents also then have to be prepared to invest in trying to understand mm -hmm. how to educate and train their kids with new technologies and things like that. Right, yeah. Because it's like, it takes two hands to cut, right? Uh, the teachers are responsible for what goes on in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. The teachers are not responsible for an individual, student, individual child. Mm -hmm. They're one of the parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, I guess, do you have any thoughts on how schools at large, whether national or international, can evolve to equip I guess students for the future that's heavily influenced by AI and other technological shifts. I think it might be interesting to think about the example of um, Mr. Nadia Makarin, um, if you're aware, like mm -hmm. the Indonesian Minister of like, Culture, yeah. Technology, Education, yeah. stuff of that nature right there. Yeah. After implementing the whole Merdeka Belajar concept and then essentially onboarding like thousands of teachers uh, into essentially like different forms of software to unite the entirety of uh, Indonesia and essentially coordinating a whole well open data or well, standard within Indonesia that has led to into well the ability of the Indonesian government to I guess like analyze data to even incentivize schools to perform well and to learn from the best performing schools right there it does seem that like. You know, there are some moves out there um, that are interesting in our neighbouring countries at large, but I guess when you think about, well, Malaysia at large, right? Like, I guess, what do you see as some of the, well, unique challenges that we face on this stage? And I guess, like, what are the, some of the things that you think that we can do? Unique challenges? I think we are a particularly risk-averse society. Uh, we probably value tradition and conventionality a bit too much. So, I mean like someone like Nadeem, um, who obviously because he he, were, he founded um, Gojek and so has the entrepreneur background willing to at least try different things. You know, I don't know that 
even if we have a minister or a director general of education that's willing to like try things in Malaysia, whether then the inertia at the teacher level or even the parents will be like, ah, you want to try this with my kids' education? Go fly cut, you know? I, I, I worry about that because yeah. I think as a society, we're quite risk averse. So I think the number one thing is, okay lah, then you need somebody who has a bit iron fist to be like, hey, sure. we are all changing, yeah. nothing you can do about it, let's come along for the ride. Because, yeah. because even Nadine, how was he to know that this thing was going to work? But he had to try lah. And, and, yeah, yeah, sure. And, and I think these kinds of things where people are willing to try ambitious, bold things should be rewarded, even if the outcome, whatever, the outcome is the outcome. But you have to, by just doing more of it, and then you never know what will work. And I think Malaysia, if you talk about Unichat, I think we're a bit too risk averse. Uh, Singapore, I would say, is the same thing. Uh, where we like conventionality a bit too much. Mm, yeah, I mean, Particularly if we think about like, you know, switching from science to math, just English to Malay, English to Malay, that sort of thing. Of course, maybe there are like some political reasons behind that, but of course, like, you know, there's the maybe like lack of political will to actually like, as you said, about, like, I have this and then make sure that the people who are actually within the schools are able to actually teach English and implement that program. But okay, that's uh, something to think about for sure. Now, I guess like my last question on uh, this list, then I guess, would you share, I guess, like your philosophy on education at large? Like, do you have a, a thought on, I guess, the importance, I guess, of education for the development of, well, not just like ourselves as individuals, but also our society as a whole? You know, I think, I think if I give you my philosophy, it's also with somebody who has had the privilege of going through what I went through, which won't be readily available for most people. Yes. Um, so I think I just want to also recognize that there's some of that embedded into this philosophy thing, like, because I do think that uh, education is probably, in my view, higher on the Maslow hierarchy of needs than I would say some other people might say, because some people will say they need education because they need a job, they need, they need security of income and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Whereas, uh, you know, I might think of it as more, it's for self-actualization, is to understand the world and that's the kind of stuff that, you know, uh, also inherently comes with some privilege um, and I think it's important to recognize that. But I do think that there's no reason it can't be both. Um, the reason why we educate people is to try and make sure that we have a productive workforce and all the kind of for a nation. Every nation has done this. Um, and then the question is, what more can we go from there? So I, I think not everybody needs to, not everybody needs to pursue the highest qualification. It's up to them based on that. But I do think that adaptability is really, really important. Um, and if you're going to be adaptable, you have to be a lifelong learner of whatever it is. It doesn't have to be books. It doesn't have to be. But you have to learn new skills, learn new ways of doing things. I think insofar as education is important for that adaptability, then I think if we can actually train a generation of people to learn to be resourceful and adaptable, I think we'll be fine. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much um, for the interview. Is there anything in particular that you want to share, I guess, like with the world or with the generation to come? Uh, perhaps maybe like, I don't know, like what you hope will be the legacy essentially that you might uh, need as well? <laughs> I've never thought, I mean, I don't think about legacies and things like that. <laughs> Just that, uh, you know, okay. if you want to intern in Kazana, let me know. But thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Wow.